There's nothing connected with the staging of a motion picture that a woman cannot do as easily as a man, and there is no reason why she cannot completely master every technicality of the art. Hello. My name is Emma. This is the first video in a series that I would like to start called Bite Size Film History. So what is Bite Size Film History? But the goal of Bite Size Film History is to make a relatively concise and accessible way for people to learn about film history, um, especially film history that has been historically underrepresented, meaning the work of women, the work of queer people, the work of people of color, etc., so on and so forth, what have you. I would like to go through and explore different like film movements, important filmmakers, technical advancements within the medium, um, and basically how they all contributed to create the movies that we know today. To start off the series, I thought that I would talk about a super early filmmaker who I've been really interested in since I learned about her in film school. Her name is Alice Guy Blaché. She is the first female filmmaker ever and one of the first directors in film history. A lot of my information came from this documentary, Be Natural, The Untold Story of Alice Guy Blaché. It's a really great documentary. I would recommend it if you're interested in like a deeper dive into some of her filmography. Ms. Blaché was the first and for over a decade the only female filmmaker. We don't have a great idea of the exact number of films that she did in her career, the estimates range from somewhere between 600 to 1,000 films. She was a pioneer technically, thematically. Um, the fact that she was a woman was also very interesting for the time. Not as interesting as you might think, but still notable. She was the contemporary of some other filmmakers who you may or may not have heard of, uh, including George Melier, the Lumiere brothers, and uh, Thomas Edison. We don't like Thomas Edison, but that's a whole other video. In addition, she trained a lot of other really skilled directors who went on to make their own contributions to the industry, which is a really interesting thing to think about. Um, her career lasted over two decades, and her body of work outpaced all three of the contemporaries I just mentioned. Despite being one of the early contributors to film, uh, up until recently, relatively recently, um, Guy Blaché's work was just kind of overlooked by the majority of film historians. So her technical achievements. She was one of the first to start using film as a vehicle for narratives. Um, when film was first developed, it was used a lot to document life and was kind of a spectacle, but she was able to see that it had potential as a storytelling medium. She was also on the forefront of techniques like the close-up, hand-tented color, and synchronized sound, where you could synchronize a record to the film, and then you could play the record so it would seem like it had the sound. Alfred Hitchcock actually referenced her as being one of his inspirations as a child. Guy Blaché made a lot of films in her career, as I mentioned. Many of them were comedies, a lot of them were also social commentary films. She was known to do both of them well. She combined both elements in a film that I've seen called The Consequences of Feminism. It explores the idea of gender and the critique of the feminist movement in a really humorous way. She was also known for her inclusion of really strong and interesting roles for children, which was not super common at the time, as well as, we'll get into this in a little bit, but she founded a studio called Solax, and during that time, uh, they were making a lot of westerns because they were very popular, and a lot of the westerns that came out of her studio were known for having strong roles for female characters. She made films on a variety of issues, including anti-Semitism, um, and she was actually the first person to direct a film with an all-black cast. It's a film from 1912, 
with all that entails. But she is the first person to have directed a film with an all-black cast, so. Worth mentioning. Her maiden name was Guy, so Alice Guy became a secretary to Leon Gamont. Gamont was involved in kind of the race to make the motion picture profitable. It was a really big thing in the late 1890s. I guess the mid-1890s, because it finally worked in 1895, but through then there was this big push to see who could successfully project a motion picture and make it profitable to people. In 1895, the Lumiere brothers were the ones who were able to finally succeed, and both Gamont and Guy were at the screening, and I think Guy herself described it as kind of the birth of cinema. A year later, she was still the secretary of Leon Gamont, and she proposed using a camera to go out and shoot some short, like, scenarios with some friends of hers, and Gamont agreed on the condition that it did not affect her work. So she, along with a few friends, made the film La Fioshu, which translates to The Cabbage Fairy. The original one from 1896 does exist, but the quality is better in the remake they did in 1900. So I'm going to put that one here. She was the writer, the director, and the producer of the film. The reason that this was a pretty big deal was that at the time, as I mentioned, film was really used to just document daily life in parts of the world that most people had never been to. And so, though it was kind of limited, this mythological kind of story that Guy was telling was one of the first fictional narratives to appear. The Cabbage Fairy became incredibly popular, and in 1897, Gamont named Guy the head of production for films in order to try and sell Gamont cameras. From there, she developed the Gamont House style. This was an amusing anecdote that I found in the documentary, which was that in France, uh, there was a massive epidemic of script theft different production companies would be making like the same films right after each other because they were paying people to steal the scripts and Elise was not she was not on board with this so she went ahead and she like planted a script she dusted it with fingerprint powder to figure out who it was and she ended up catching the young janitor boy that they had hired who had been paid off by another company to steal her scripts so her two most acclaimed films of the time are called The Passion and Esmeralda, and they are adaptations of the story of Jesus and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, respectively. She meets her future husband in 1906. He's a cameraman for one of her films. I feel it's important to tell you that none of, none of the things he shot were usable. You'll see why I find it important to tell you that later. But in 1907, they get married. She leaves her comp she leaves her job at Gamont, and they move to America. This brings us to the Solax period of Guy Blaché's career, because at this point she's married and now she is. I mentioned her. His name was Herbert Blaché, right? Hopefully, otherwise we'll just insert that clip there. So Herbert still works at Gamont, and he is producing films for them in the States. He hires a woman named Lois Weber. Um, she was also known as Mrs. Smalley at the time. And uh, 
under Alice's guidance and instruction, she became one of, not one of, she became the first female director in America. First female writer and director in America. So in 1910, uh, the Gamont studio space was not being fully used, so Alice went ahead and she rented the space. From there, she was directing and managing all aspects of the Solax productions. Gamont was actually the company who was distributing uh, Solax films internationally as well, so they continued the working relationship there. In 1911, she bought land and built a Solax-only studio in Portly, New Jersey, which was kind of the Hollywood before Hollywood. In 1912, she started experimenting more in her films. There were new techniques, new special effects that she was trying. She also was editing her own films at this point and was training other people to edit, which I found really interesting. Herbert ends up eventually leaving his job at Gamont's and Guy Blaché appoints him president of Solax and he founds Blaché Features where they both direct and produce. The beginning of World War I and the economic depression pushed both of them to start doing contract work for other companies. The film industry begins pushing west. We have to thank Thomas Edison for that. So Herbert leaves his family to go to Hollywood. And he takes an actress na named Catherine Calvert with him as his mistress. Do you see why it was important that I tell you that his camera work was not usable? One of the Solax buildings burns down. Elise catches influenza during the Spanish flu pandemic, which had to suck. So she moves to Hollywood with her and Herbert's two children, who's the assistant director for two of his films. And in 1920, her final film, Tarnished Reputations, is released. Solax has to be auctioned off because of the e economic issues that are happening. And she ends up returning to France with her two children. So after Elise returns to France, um, in the early 1920s, she tries to start making films there again, but no one is willing to hire her. The history of the Gamont Company ends up being published. Elise is not mentioned. Uh, a documentary filmmaker makes a film about the abandoned Fort Lee, New Jersey. Credits Herbert with Solax, which we don't love. Gamont himself in 1939 asks Elise to work with him on a revised version of the Gamont Company history talking about her work in film. While she's doing this, she learns that a lot of her films have been credited to an assistant director that she worked with at the time. Unfortunately, the second edition of the History of the Gamont Company, as well as a article by a journalist who Le Leon Gamont specifically told to talk to Elise, are published without mention of her. Leon, Leon was really trying his best, and just every, every historian was like, on the contrary, no. Georges Sadoul is one of the first people to write an academic history on film. Um, he incorrectly credits Guy Blaché with a film titled Misadventures of a Calf's Head. She would hold a grudge about this for the rest of her life. Honestly can't blame her. Her films The Passion and Esmeralda are credited to her assistant director, La Fille Achou, The Cabbage Fairy, is credited to an actor named Henri Gallet. Later, Sadoul would kind of admit that he had just kind of gotten all of his information through hearsay, which is really great to know that, like, the first, first text on film is just mostly hearsay. At the end of his life, uh, Leon Gamont would write to Elise and tell her that she was one of his closest contributors and he really treasured working with her. Still, no one feels the need to publish Elise's name anywhere in regards to Gamont's history at all, so that's awesome. Unfortunately, she spent the later part of her life trying to track down her films. Uh, Early film wasn't preserved very well, they were often dismantled, or they were kept in poor conditions, and so Elise died thinking that only like three of her films existed, um, which was really unfortunate, and if I remember correctly, they wouldn't 
let her see them. She also wrote her memoirs, which no one wanted to publish, and she spent a lot of time trying to correct the record and explain her position in film history, and there just wasn't a lot of interest at the time. She died in 1968. Only two full films and a portion of a third were found, which is really unfortunate. Eight years after her death, uh, her memoirs were published. People started learning her name. They were questioning why she wasn't a bigger figure in the film history that was being taught. It sparked a hell of a debate in France. Basically, people claimed that she had faded into obscurity because she wasn't talented. And the opposition was saying, well, no, she was. It's just she's been overwritten repeatedly. At the time, all of her work was in archives. No one could see any of it, so it was entirely speculation. There are now as many as 300 films that have been found that were written, directed, or produced by her. And while many of them are still inaccessible in archives, some of them have been digitized and are accessible today. But that is the life and career of Elise Guy Blaché. Like I said, I got a lot of the information from the documentary Be Natural. I would recommend the documentary if you like really want to see more of her work because they have a lot more access to certain clips and things than I'm going to when I construct this video. I just thought it was only right to start off with her because she's been overwritten for so long and she was such an early contributor. Let me know what topics, filmmakers, thingamajigs you want me to check out, not check out, uh, cover soon. You can find me doing movie reviews on Instagram and all sorts of other random stuff, but uh, it's been a pleasure and I hope to see you soon. Bye.